Hello everyone and welcome to the IB Biology 2.4 interactive lecture video and this one is all about proteins. We have talked about proteins already a few times within this video series like in topic 1 when we talked about the cell membrane and transport and also in video 2.1 when we introduced macromolecules. But in this video we get to go even deeper into protein structure and in order for us to learn the structure of proteins we first need to understand their building blocks aka the molecules that proteins are made out of which are called amino acids all amino acids have common structural components and revolve around a central set of three atoms which are nitrogen carbon and another carbon I often refer to this as NCC, and it is a great indicator to look for to help you distinguish proteins from the other three macromolecules. Branching from the nitrogen are two bonds that hold two hydrogen atoms, and we call this an amine group that is written as NH2. And branching off of the end carbon, we have a double bond with oxygen and a single bond with another oxygen bound to a hydrogen, which can be written as COOH. We call this a carboxyl group. Now the central carbon here is really important. It is already bound to the other nitrogen and carbon that make up the NCC backbone, and in addition, it shares another single bond with a hydrogen, and another bond with another structure. Now this structure here is nothing that you have to memorize because it changes based on the amino acid. And because it comes in different forms, we usually write this as a variable group, noted with a capital R. So it is often called the R group. There are 20 different amino acids that we know of. Each one has a different structure connected to that central carbon that takes the spot of the R group. We can see here an image that gives us a small representation of all 20 amino acids. And the thing to note here is that the only difference between all of these structures is that variable R group. Otherwise, the core structure of the amino acid with the NCC backbone, amine, and carboxyl groups are all the same. Each individual amino acid has a unique name. Take a look and see if you can find the name of this larger amino acid pictured here. If you said tryptophan, you got it right. We know that there are 20 possible amino acids, but how many different proteins are there? The answer is a lot. What we need to understand here is that there are 20 different amino acids that can be linked together to make a protein. And if we change the amino acid, whether it's the structure or the order, it creates a different protein. So you can see that with 20 options to choose from and many proteins that have 50 or more amino acids, the options for what can be created seem almost endless. The average protein count for plants and animals is somewhere between the tens and hundreds of thousands. We have talked about this reaction a bit before in a previous video, but you need to know that a condensation reaction occurs when two amino acids are linked together. Remember that a condensation reaction links two structures together by creating a water molecule. So for this to occur, you need to at least have one available oxygen and two available hydrogen atoms that allow the bond to form. If you take a look at the structure of an amino acid, you can see these available atoms from the carboxyl group on one side, which provides one oxygen and one hydrogen and the amine group on the other, which has the second hydrogen. As this bond forms, the H2O is released as a water molecule and there is a bond left between the carbon and the nitrogen of the two different amino acids. This reaction occurs many times to create long polypeptide chains that later become functioning proteins. Now, proteins are pretty cool because they can take on some amazing shapes, and we need to understand how proteins create these shapes as it has everything to do with their structure. When amino acids are linked together in a simple chain, we call this the primary structure of a protein, which again only details the peptide bonds that hold the amino acid together. From this information, we can extract the order of amino acids that make up the primary chain. Once a primary structure is formed, it usually does not stay that way. It instead ends up coiling in on itself, which can form patterns that we call secondary protein structure. These common patterns are primarily alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Both of these structures are created when a hydrogen bond is formed between the hydrogen within the amine group of one amino acid that is attracted to the oxygen within the carboxyl group of another amino acid within the same chain. Depending on how these hydrogen bonds are oriented, the result is either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. The next level of structure a protein will fold into is its tertiary structure, which is when there are more interactions that take place between the side chains, or those variable R groups that we talked about. So in this situation, we could have an R group from a beta pleated sheet bond with an R group from an alpha helix. 
This continues to fold the protein in a unique way that in turn gets it ready to perform its specific function. These tertiary interactions often include variable groups bonding via ionic interactions, polar associations, hydrogen bonds, and disulfide linkages, also called disulfide bridges. The last level of protein structure is called quaternary, which we're actually going to talk about a bit more on the next slide. Understanding these structural levels of proteins is very important, so make sure to study them and all of their associated bonds and formations. We know that proteins are made up of chains of amino acids that fold into a final structure, but the highest level of protein structure is actually made out of more than one polypeptide chain, so you can think of it as multiple tertiary structures coming together to make a larger structure that has a specialized, unique function. We call this a quaternary protein, which was also noted on the last slide. A commonly used example of this is the protein hemoglobin, which is pictured here. Hemoglobin is a unique quaternary protein because it is made up of four different amino acid chains, which you can see here as two blue and two red. On each of the four chains is a heme group which contains a central iron atom. It is the heme group that makes this molecule able to hold on to oxygen and transport it around the body within red blood cells. And again, the important thing to note here is that this structure contains more than one tertiary protein structure making it a quaternary protein that you can't live without. When proteins are created and folded properly, they are able to do their job, just like the hemoglobin on the last slide is used to carry oxygen around the body in red blood cells. But what happens if the shape of a protein changes dramatically? The simple answer, it doesn't work anymore. If a protein structure gets altered to the point where it can no longer function, we call it denaturation. This can happen to proteins within the human body based on changing conditions, which primarily are temperature and pH. Our body works to maintain a stable internal environment, and the proteins in our body work best at the average temperature. If the body becomes too warm, it can disrupt the hydrogen bonds that help give proteins their shape and hold them together, causing them to fall apart and denature. Additionally, a drastic change of internal pH within regions of the body can alter the overall shape and solubility of a protein resulting in the loss of function. For this reason, the body also works to regulate and stabilize pH levels to be appropriate based on the location. Like the stomach, for example, is supposed to be acidic, and the proteins within the stomach work properly in a low pH environment. In other locations of the body where pH is supposed to be neutral, the proteins that work there are most efficient when the pH is near neutral. Proteins are unique because of the structure of their amino acids, but the only way your body knows how to create this unique sequence is to get the information from a series of other molecules, all starting with your DNA. Your DNA holds a genetic sequence that makes you unique, and therefore able to build some unique proteins. But we can't just simply take the code from the DNA and create a protein. Instead, there are a series of steps and molecules involved that make this process function. Let's briefly go over the steps shown as they are covered in greater detail in another video. First, the code of DNA gets copied into a messenger RNA strand. This strand is able to exit the nucleus with the instructions to build a protein. Out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm of the cell, this mRNA strand then attaches to a ribosome, which is a specialized organelle that is designed to put proteins together. The ribosome reads the mRNA sequence three bases at a time called a codon, and each codon then picks up a specific amino acid to add to a growing protein chain. This process continues until a stop signal is read, in which the chain of amino acids will then break off and fold into its final form. For simplicity's sake, let's say that this protein that was just created ends up being a pigment found in your eye. The way that the light reflects off this protein makes others view your eyes as a brown color. Now the only reason your eyes appear to be brown is because the DNA had the code to make that specific protein that shape. Another person that has a bit more green in their eyes would have a different DNA sequence that would lead to the creation of a different mRNA sequence that would in turn create a different protein. The main idea being your genes and genetic code end up ultimately determining how you build the proteins in your body. As I'm sure you already know, different organisms can create a wide range of proteins that they use for very specific functions. If we look at some general categories of proteins, we have things like enzymes, antibodies, and other hormones that help with a large amount of functions at and above the chemical and cellular level. But we can get much more specific than this. And for the IB exam, you need to know of a few specific examples of proteins that organisms make to showcase their great molecular diversity. So let's name them and talk about what they do. First, we have insulin, which is a very important hormone that helps balance your blood sugar. 
Insulin specifically sends signals to your body to lower your blood sugar and works in opposition to another hormone called glucagon that signals for your body to raise your blood sugar levels. These two proteins working together ensure that your blood sugar remains at a relatively stable level. Next up is a protein called Rubisco, which is an abbreviated name. This is an important enzyme found in plants that helps the process of photosynthesis. This enzyme helps with the first step of the light-independent stage of photosynthesis and facilitates the first reaction that pulls in atmospheric CO2 to bond with another 5-carbon molecule. Next up we have immunoglobulins. These proteins are specially designed antibodies that can target specific antigens found on pathogens that enter our body. This helps our immune system find and destroy invaders like viruses. Next is rhodopsin. This is a specialized protein found within the rod cells that sit in the tissue that makes up the back of our eye, called the retina. This protein helps with detecting light and allows you to see under different conditions, especially when light sources are faint, aka when it's very dark outside. Next up, we have a structural protein called collagen. Collagen is made in animals and is the most abundant protein in your body. Its unique structure provides important support for your skin, bones, tendons, and muscle tissue. And last but not least, we have spider silk. Spider silk is made out of a very unique protein that is, obviously, made by spiders. It is used to strengthen their webs, and compared to other structural support building blocks, it is extremely strong. By weight, it is stronger than steel. Pretty amazing considering that it is built via the same method of any other protein. 